According to the American Psychological Association, the divorce rate in the United States is estimated to be around 40 to 50 percent for first marriages. The divorce rate for second marriages is higher than for first marriages, with estimates ranging from 60 to 67 percent and even higher for third marriages again, according to the American Psychological Association. While most marriages don't begin with divorce in mind, when divorce does happen, there are a few resources that help dads navigate that reality. My guest will shed some light on what a dad facing divorce can expect. He will also share important tips that every dad facing divorce needs to know All this in just a moment, so don't go anywhere. Welcome to the Fatherhood Challenge, a movement to awaken and inspire fathers everywhere to take great pride in their role and to challenge society to understand how important fathers are to the stability and culture of their family's environment. Now, here's your host, Jonathan Guerrero. Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. My guest is Andy Heller. Andy never thought he would end up as an expert on divorce, but after his own divorce, he saw a crucial hole in the self-help space for men and women navigating through divorce. So he wrote a book called Take the High Road, Divorce with Compassion for Yourself and Your Family. Andy, thank you so much for being on the Fatherhood Challenge. Jonathan, it's my pleasure. We love to start out with the dad joke. That is probably one of my most favorite parts of the program. So Andy, what is your favorite dad joke? Well, this one got an amazing cringe from my 13-year-old daughter when I said it at the first time. So I told her a story about a dad, and he's he's having some peas, uh, and one of his favorite vegetable, and he drops some. Some fall from his mouth, and they fall on his body. He said, oh, my goodness, I peed on myself. So <laughs> I'm laughing. I'm laughing for five minutes and my daughter is looking at me like, like, please get out of the car. <laughs> that was a true dad joke. <laughs> it was. <laughs> and there's more of those too, but I know we want to give, give your, uh, give your listeners a lot more important nuggets, but that is a good one. <laughs> yes. Thank you for sharing that. Let's start with your own story. How did your own divorce experience lead you to writing a book? So I had kind of a high conflict divorce myself. I did some things well, did some things really wrong, um, did some things okay. And I read a lot of other books as I was going through my own divorce. And these other books out there, Jonathan, they're from a perspective of a, of a therapist, a mediator, attorney, um, and they're they're not bad, but the problem was they were not comprehensive and they were very much speaking from one perspective. I'm a businessman. So what I started to do is I recognized that I saw that gap in a divorce book space and I started an eight year project of interviewing field experts. I interviewed the best attorneys, divorce attorneys and the co-parent counselors, daddy coaches, um, kids therapists, adult therapists. And what I did as I organized their council, oh, part, part of me, I also interviewed dozens of men and women who themselves went through high conflict divorces and landed in good places. So I took the lessons from these experts and I kind of organized it into a series of 46 tips and strategies, kind of like a best practices manual, not just for getting through your divorce, but also for co-parenting effectively with somebody you couldn't live under one roof with. And I'm kind of humbled. Uh, my book has not been out so long. I've got about a hundred already five-star reviews. And I, I think I have filled a bit of a niche there. So that's my story. When does a dad know when it's time to consider divorce? So let's assume and answer in your question that there's not a third party involved. If there's a third party involved, uh, then that really complicates uh, complicates things, Jonathan. The main question for a dad, and it's probably the same for a woman, is you need to look at your marriage and try to understand, is my marriage stale or is my marriage broken? That's the key question that one has to come up with because there's a lot of marriages that are stale and they need a reboot. I absolutely recommend, if you can, just slow down. Take your marriage and and take your partner and get in front of a a marriage counselor who will help you determine which of these buckets your marriage falls into. 
And a lot of people who are not happy, they're a rush to get on the other side, particularly if children are involved, don't rush. There's a, there's a second benefit to that, Jonathan. And your adult, most of us as adults, we will analyze and dissect our children's, our, our parents' marriages. All right. So even if there's a 1% chance of salvaging your, your marriage, all right, think about that conversation with your adult children when you look at them in the eye and said, you guys were so important that mom and I or dad and I committed to therapy to try to figure out if we could salvage it. And we, de- we decided we, we, we couldn't, but that's going to be pretty powerful. So I don't see a downside to committing to therapy, even if it turns out that the marriage cannot be salvaged. And for the dad or the mom, if it turns out that the result of therapy is the marriage can't be salvaged, you'll be a lot more sure that you're going down the right path. Your children, when they're adults, will be asking you questions. And it's so powerful for you guys to be able to look them in the eye and said, we gave it everything we could. Even though we were not happy, we committed to some therapy to see if there's anything there that could be saved. And that's a really powerful message. And that's going to help your children when they're adults understand really that you know marriage is a pretty serious thing. And um, even when it wasn't working out, they're going to really respect the effort that you put in to try to save it. You said we... That's really interesting. That was a very deliberate word. It was. How does it become, we did everything? I'm also an absolute believer, after all of these interviews I did, that you you don't want to be bashing your ex, all right? Mm. So the children, even as adults, should understand that it was a collaborative decision to try to save the marriage. There is no benefit to try to um, present yourself as the better party of the two. Um, Now, one of the things I'm going to say, which is probably one of the most powerful realizations in my book. So everybody has said for years, don't don't bash your ex. It harms your children. So there's nothing new about that. And that's in my book also. What is different, Jonathan, is something I learned from a therapist that was It was just like that, oh my God, it was a wow moment. I put this in the book. Children, even as young as four or five, understand intuitively one thing, and that is they are the byproduct, genetic byproduct, their DNA is a biological man and a biological woman, okay, 50-50. So they understand that. So if one parent is criticizing the other parent, the child internalizes this as self-critique. So that's so I've never heard it explained that way as being a reason why you should not be criticizing your ex. So yes, you do things, you do, you, you, you try to save the marriage as a we. You co-parent as a we. And doesn't mean it's easy, which is why books like mine exist. But it's really important and it benefits the children. The lurking question that is in the back of every child's mind that they may not verbalize it exactly this way, but throughout their childhood, they are constantly asking this question subconsciously in their brain. And that one question is, are you there for me? And they are asking that question of both parents. Yep. When divorce is inevitable, what is the process for preparing kids for the separation? Can they be insulated from what's ahead? Uh, to a degree, for sure. I mean, they cannot be, um, they're going to be affected. So uh, insulated in full? No. But you can take steps to make sure that the, the, the children have an advocate for them and they're, they are, um, they're, not as, they're, they're not as affected. The number one thing I recommend, and this came from the research, is to involve a child therapist. And I say child therapist, even if your children are 13 or 14, and you insist on this starting three or four months before the children are set to learn that the parents are splitting up. 
Why? The reason is that this allows the therapist to establish a foundation with the kids so that he or she is ready when they hear the news and they can be the advocate. This is probably the number one gift you can give your children is to get them a therapist. And let me explain it this way. You've got some drama playing out. Even if it's an amicable divorce, you've got the drama of figuring out uh, a home for yourself and how you how are you going to parent with just one person with your ex did some roles and helped out? What about going back into the workforce or the additional financial pressures of splitting house, the, the household up? So you've got a lot on your plate and the kids need their own advocate who is only focused on the kids' needs. You cannot be, as a parent, both a disruptor and a healer, okay? Like it or not, the children's lives are being disrupted, and you've got a lot on your plate. And if you give the children a gift of a therapist and you begin the therapy before they hear of the split, the therapist will be in a position to really help the kids with as soft a landing as possible. And this came from a a brilliant child therapist in California who said her new protocol is to establish, begin the therapy with the children three months before they are to get the news. So it sounds like the purpose in starting early with therapy with children, a big part of that is a rapport. The therapist has time to build up, to build that rapport with the child uh, and vice versa. So when it is time to really deal with heavy news. Exactly. The, uh, the word I would use is a foundation. If the, if the therapist has three months to establish a foundation of trust, then he or she will be that sounding board that the children need. Uh, so, yeah, uh, absolutely. And it's it's such a... A, a, a huge benefit for the kids. And what I learned from these therapists that I spoke to, they said, these kids will really check in and tell me what is going on, things that they're simply not going to tell their parents. I would imagine a dad should probably have his own therapist too as well, because then you have some sort of a barrier to where you're not dumping all of your stresses and all of the side effects of the pending separation or divorce on your children. You know what? I'm going to, I'm going to add to that again. This book is not about my divorce, but I'm going to speak here on in first person. I'm a, I'm a pretty together and grounded guy. I was not out there to try to harm my ex and, but we had a high conflict divorce. And in one co-parenting session, the co-parent counselor that we were using said to us, you guys are both got a lot of drama here. You could probably benefit from a therapist. I said, all right, it can't hurt, but I want a therapist who has done a lot of work specifically with divorced dads. She gave me three names and I saw this therapist for a handful of years, Jonathan, and I've got to tell you, I, I, I was floored. How many times I would walk into her office, something would happen and I'm a, I'm a pretty reasonable thinker and would come and I'd say, well, look, this is what happened, but don't worry. I've got my solution. This is what I'm going to do. And she'd listen and she'd listen. She put, and she'd go into her therapy speak. Well, you know, Andy, you're not going to do what you intend to do. You're going to do the opposite. And here's why. And that one of those sessions is actually what led me to decide to write this book. I recognized at that time how much, how affected I was and how emotionally compromised I was, and I was not making optimal decisions. And anyhow, so absolutely, you dads, um, suck it up. It can help you find yourself a good therapist. And it's not a bad thing to ask for a therapist who has done work with divorced men. I was one of those dads that um, just thought that therapy was, um, I'll just say it, having a therapist was not a, a, a very masculine thing to do. It, it just really felt like a very, a very wimpy approach to, to things. And so I never saw therapy as, as something like you would do preventative maintenance on a vehicle. If you would like your engine to not seize up someday, 
you probably should be changing your oil at regular intervals, not wait till your engine is about to seize up or already has. And so I never saw therapy that way. It seems more challenging for men to accept that this is a very normal and essential part of your mental health, uh, not just something you should just do in crisis. You're spot on, Jonathan. And and yeah, we men, maybe it's the whole macho thing. I don't know. We're less inclined to read books. We're less inclined to seek out a therapist. Um, and, you know, I I also came from a background where I, I really, like, I, I didn't pay much attention to the therapy community. It was really helpful, guys. I mean, I, I, I and I cannot tell you how many times I walked out of that office like, my God, her angle was completely different than what my, mine was on this point when I walked in an hour earlier, but she's right. She's right. And it really helped me get to a healthier place faster. I've remarried. I have this amazing wife and I, I, be, I, I think she helped me be a better dad. So, and if, you know, it, it's, that's why we do this, you know, and, but we, we, but the main point I would say is that I didn't realize the degree at which I was emotionally off until I started to see the therapist and re- realize I really wasn't thinking clearly and I needed that voice in my ear. And, the, and it's really important. Let me make one more point. That voice cannot be a family member or a friend because they're mm. going to be on team dad or team mom. Yes. Yes. You, this is the benefit of a therapist beyond anything else is that, They are there to help you, but they're paid to tell you things that you might not want to hear. And that's what we need. That's that's the best possible advice when we're going through what can be the most disruptive parts of our lives. Something else I think I might add to that that I think could be helpful for dads is that there are many different types of therapies. In the therapy speak or therapy world, they would probably refer to them as modalities. Um, or you could just think of them as modes, different ways to do therapy. There is the conventional way, which you just sit in an office in front of a therapist, uh, and they listen to you and, and they might ask you some questions about their story. And then it, it's a very analytical approach to whatever's going on in your life, uh, problem solving, um, and then a little bit of, uh, an empathetic approach. Uh, then there's another modality. There's many others. I'm just going to cover some of the two that I'm the fami- that I'm familiar with. The second one is called IFS. Uh, so IFS deals with parts. So it doesn't go into necessarily the specifics of your story. It goes deep into what's going on in in your mind when things are happening, and it splits everything up into parts. So you might have a conversation with a friend, and maybe you're talking about a decision that you're making. And you might say to that friend, hey, part of me thinks I should do this. And another part of me thinks I should go do that. And so that's example. You, you think in parts. And so IFS goes deep into a parts modality. What's going on with the different aspects and parts of you? How are they interacting with each other? How do you know when something is bothering you? And furthermore, what do you do about it? When this happens, how do you respond? So if one therapy modality doesn't work for you, explore others. There may be one specifically tailored to how you think. I want to change gears a little bit too. Is there an amical pathway to a cooperative parenting relationship? And if so, how does one move in that direction? Absolutely, Jonathan, there is. And that's a lot of what I talk about in my book. The what I would suggest the number one thing you guys could do if you're not starting out there is to seek out what's called a, a co-parenting counselor or a parenting coordinator. And this is a person who is typically a trained therapist who you meet with on a schedule. They could start off as once a month uh, and you go and the parenting counselor helps the parents who couldn't live together reach agreements on parenting until time elapses that they can get there on their own. So 
Uh, this is something I became familiar with from a personal level. I didn't even know this existed. And I credit my ex for um, for setting up the schedule. And it was it's incredibly helpful these first years when it felt like no matter what I said, she would want to do the opposite. And the beauty about something like this, Jonathan, is you pay for what you use. So the way these things can work out, you go frequently at first when you guys can't agree on what to give the kids for dinner in the different homes. And then as time elapses and works its magic and your ability to co-parent improves, you go less and less. So this is a type, I would look at this like a, a captain on a sailboat, all right? Yeah, you can probably sail yourself, but the captain will get you there faster. And uh, this captain, this co-parenting counselor can help you and your ex get to that point where you can co-parent in an amicable way that really focuses on the children's interests being paramount. I have heard of so many divorced parents uh, or parents going through this process where they try to solve that alone. They're trying to figure that out without any help. Uh, and this is new information to me. I've never heard of this. I did not know that there are counselors that just work with that specific situation with parents who can't agree on co-parenting decisions and helping them work through this. So this is a really big hint that parents should not try to tackle those conflicts alone. A good co-parenting counselor can also assist, if you're not divorced yet, in drafting the parenting plan that goes into your MSA. So absolutely, I would look into this, everybody, and this can certainly help you get to a point where you can co-parent in a more amicable manner. Are children of divorced parents statistically more likely to divorce? What can dads in a divorce situation do to help and encourage their own children to have a healthy relationship and a strong marriage? The answer to the first question is yes, but I don't know exactly what that statistic is. But it is, yes, children of divorced parents are more likely to get divorced. Uh, what In terms of what dads can do, uh, I would say give you two things. Number one, don't bash the mom, okay, like we talked about earlier. That's really not going to help your kids um, have a healthy relationship on their own. The second thing I, I would say is probably, in my humble opinion, and this goes beyond a podcast on just on divorce is I believe the most powerful part of parenting that is not that is often overlooked is modeling model for your children uh, what it means to be in a great relationship. So you find a partner, a new partner, and you, you love that partner. You're a, you're a good husband uh, to that partner or just a good partner if you don't get married and have your children witness that. In my own world, <clears throat> I have remarried to a wonderful woman. Um, my children love her and, you know, I show her affection. I show her respect um, and the children see that. So they grow up seeing, well, you know, dad landed in a good place. He's got a very healthy relationship. It just wasn't with mom. So modeling is really important. And along those lines, you know, don't introduce your kids to every girlfriend you have. That's not what they want to see. So you wait until you have a very serious relationship. Your kids meet that person and you, you show those, <clears throat> your children the right way to treat a woman respectfully. And that hopefully will... Um, decrease the chances of your children uh, getting divorced and make, making, um, making better picks themselves. This next question is really important to uh, a lot of the divorced dads or dads about to be divorced that are listening to this program. How can a recently divorced dad find the motivation to still be an amazing dad and stay in his children's lives when facing overwhelming obstacles? One fourth of my book is about taking care of yourself as you go through divorce. And it's the one thing that many people overlook is their own needs. Your divorce 
it, it, the, the really powerful part of your question, I think, Jonathan, is divorce sucks. Divorce can be depressing. Even if you're not, te- you don't have a tendency to get depressed, it can be depressing. And as a dad, uh, you may be very, you're, you're more likely to face uh, a, a, an uphill custodial battle. And that can be really demoralizing. So you've got to, the answer to your question is a number of strategies and action steps you can take. If you're not divorced yet, you can, you make sure your agreement, the, the MSA you're about to sign gives you that path. The number one thing, the, the, the two biggest things I say you want to have in that agreement is you want to have enough custodial time to be impactful. And, and one thing people overlook is geography. Geography. Make sure that you and the ex are, are, are going to stay in the same city so you can be – geography doesn't create a situation where you cannot be impactful. So in my book, I have a whole bunch of strategies of, of, and action steps you can take where you can stay involved, and, but it is tough. And um, I will also say uh, I am a glass half full guy. The book is written in that manner, but it does mean you have to take certain steps to make that your reality and to stay involved in the kids' lives. And it's sometimes um, if depends on your, your situation, your divorce. It, it might not be easy for you. I do want to emphasize that we have just scratched the surface. There's a lot more in the book that you really need to know uh, if you're navigating, if you're about to navigate a separation and a divorce. While we're at it, uh, how can dads listening, how the, can they find out more about what you're doing? How can they get your book uh, or reach out to you with any questions? Sure. Well, just, I would say just get the book because there is a website on the back of the book and you can reach out to me in that manner. The book is on Amazon. It's called Take the High Road. Divorce with Compassion for Yourself and Your Family. And the one thing I would say uh, about specifically to you dads is we dads don't read a lot, certainly self-help books. And that's that's a bummer. That's a really, that's a shame uh, because books like mine, these are resources that can help us, uh, help us dads get to that better place and uh faster and and navigate through these challenges um i don't know exactly what the statistic is but literally is three or four women for every man will purchase a self-help book and that's a shame so particularly with divorce i would say dads you know get this book uh it can help you um and i'm happy if you reach out to me to to speak and see if i could help you beyond that So dads, there's your challenge. And he just gave you the challenge. If you're facing this situation, read, read, read. And specifically, get Andy's book and read through that book cover to cover. Read it carefully. So Andy, I want to thank you so much for everything that you've shared, all of the tips, all of the wisdom. Thank you so much for being on the Fatherhood Challenge. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fatherhood Challenge. If you would like to contact us, listen to other episodes, find any resource mentioned in this program, or find out more information about the Fatherhood Challenge, please visit thefatherhoodchallenge.com. That's thefatherhoodchallenge.com. I'd like to pause and thank our proud sponsor of the Fatherhood Challenge, Zencaster. If you've thought about podcasting before and realize that you need a lot of different tools and services, those days are over. With Zencaster's all-in-one podcast production platform, you can create your podcast all in one place and distribute to Spotify, Apple, and other major destinations. But the reason I personally use and trust them with the production of this syndicated radio program is their professional broadcast quality sound. There is no better time than now to start your podcast using Zencaster for all your needs. Go to Zencaster.com slash pricing and use my code fatherhood and you'll get 30% off your first month of any Zencaster paid plan. I want you to have the same easy experiences I do for all my podcasting and content needs. 
It's time to share your story.